some of the main sort of points I'm going to make anyway. Uh, so it's going to be a short presentation which is intended to uh, stimulate discussion uh, rather than, as many of the uh, earlier papers have uh, been to provide answers. I don't have the answers. Uh, and I apologise if some of you have heard or seen bits of this before. But basically, I, I want to highlight some of the issues uh, in doing public archaeology specifically uh, and engaging with people in uh, rural areas. Um, so, uh, looking at some models of doing this. Um, oh, hang on. The, oh, I won't do that. I'll go back <laughs> uh, the, to talk about the trust, the Clue Paris Archaeological Trust. Um, our aim, our only charitable aim, is the education of the public in archaeology. That's what we do. Everything else that we do is intended to support that, whether it's research or commercial archaeology or whatever else. Uh, that's our aim. And as Viviana said, everybody in the trust is involved to some extent or another in public engagement. And I often make the point that um, my development control archaeologist is actually doing public engagement. He's the one speaking to the most reluctant audience for archaeology, which are developers who are forced to do it as a result of the specifications he writes. And so he's involved in public archaeology, just as our community archaeologist is also involved. Um, and as you heard from our Deputy Minister this morning, uh, we've been going for 40 years at all the Welsh Trusts, and we've been doing community archaeology one sort of another for all of that time. And this has followed in its development the sort of familiar trajectory of uh, starting sort of outreach and open days and very sort of top down stuff to close engagement with and use of volunteers. And we've got volunteers who work for us regularly doing all sorts of interesting uh, things which don't involve excavation. In fact, they involve dealing with. Uh, all sorts of archives and HR work and all sorts of things, and we have a series of student placements. But in terms of engagement with um, archaeology, uh, this is where I do come on to models of engagement, um, most models uh, for community engagement with archaeology have been developed in and for urban environments, that's my feeling. Uh, and also, and I've said this before uh, several times, and I'll say it again, we still really lack theoretical models. Uh, I, can you all see that? I'm not going to read from the slide unless you can't see it, but basically <coughs> we sort of lack theoretical models uh, and sometimes archaeological rigour, and I know that's been touched upon by other people. And also, uh, and again, this was something that was talked about this morning by the Minister and by Jan, um, engaging with wider areas of public policy that aren't necessarily to do with archaeology, but are nevertheless germane to the work that we do. Uh, so, to talk about the urban, and I'm very grateful to Jerry for permission to use this slide, which is still obtained now. Um, it's relatively easy to tick boxes in urban areas. Having said that, we did hear two talks uh, about two projects, the CALP project and the Royal Commission project, where it is possible to do some of that in rural areas, uh, when you've got a core, a focus project and a core focus group. But generally speaking, it's relatively easy to tick boxes in urban areas, or the sorts of boxes that our funders might like us to tick. Um, there are generally lots of people from different backgrounds. Uh, excluded groups are fairly easy to identify. There's lots of existing infrastructure to deal with social inclusion, which we can tap into. Uh, and there's been some good work done in this area. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with Rachel Kiddy's Homeless Heritage Project, for example, which is uh, something that I, I think has been a brilliant project. But these models that we use for community archaeology uh, often assume lots of young people, schools, a dense population, good public transport, uh, good internet coverage, good mobile phone coverage, all that stuff, uh, which in rural mid Wales uh, we don't have. I've also said, uh, talk about theory, I've shown this slide hundreds of times, uh, and I could go on and on, but I, I won't. Uh, we do often lack a uh, theoretical framework. This is, uh, uh, ladder of Citizen Participation, um, which was produced in the 1960s to do with uh, participation in America with uh, public projects generally, not actually just archaeology. Uh, and you've got this sort of level of, you know, the ideal citizen control, citizen power, uh, to non-participation at the bottom and tokenism. And we're sort of generally, most public archaeology projects, how much we might aspire to uh, this end of the spectrum tend to end up in the sort of tokenist end of the spectrum. And it may be that that's something that we can't, sorry, I'm moving about. <laughs> um, it may be that's something we can't 
avoid. Uh, and actually, uh, just to say to Alice, there is actually some literature on the relationship between public, commercial, and academic spheres. Oh, yeah, there spheres. is. It's, um, just, it's quite it's limited, not a lot. But, yeah. no, but, but, but there is, there is some work. Um, anyway, I'm not going really to go on about that, but I, but I think this is a big issue. that we, we do, as community archaeologists, tend to work in a, in a, in a theoretical and perhaps policy vacuum. And the policy vacuum, I mean, you mentioned, somebody mentioned, was it you, Alice? Somebody mentioned Pharaoh Convention. Uh, it was, yes. But Pharaoh Convention is very interesting uh, because actually community engagement with heritage is, is central to it, really, and it's all about experts and non-experts and the relationship between the two. Um, I think I might have said that we haven't adopted in the UK the Pharaoh Convention. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When they are. Very, very. But we can still refer to it, I think. Um, and we're not always tuned in to these sort of policy frameworks at uh, local, national, international levels. And again, as I say, not so much archaeology uh, policy frameworks, but planning, education, health, social policy, infrastructure, and so on. And, and again, Deputy Minister this morning made that important point about poverty um, and using heritage as a, as a mechanism for um, dealing with that. And of course, he was talking about community first areas, which are all urban areas, but there's a hell of a lot of rural poverty and isolation as well, which I think is perhaps not necessarily well addressed at a government level. And finally, I, I think, and it's an issue which has sort of uh, been touched upon a little bit today, uh, but often comes out in these sorts of sessions, is the question of public archaeology not being, or still accused of not being proper archaeology. It's, it's mm -hmm. somehow subordinate to other, other forms of archaeology. And here, I and this has already mentioned in a slightly different context, but I draw attention to this chap here, who, to my mind, is, is an exemplar uh, in all sorts of areas, actually, um, producing excavations to very high standards, using a lot of volunteer labour, very prompt <coughs> reporting, uh, again, to high standards, uh, and there are other areas of, of, his, of his life which you could take as an exemplar or not, depending on your view. Um, <laughs> ethically, though, we do have a duty, and this is kind of why I take issue with uh, you, I think, actually, to some extent, that, well, I don't take issue with you, I just, I just, I just <laughs> express a contrary. I, mean, I, I don't like this separation between academic and commercial and public archaeology, because we, as archaeologists, have a duty to make archaeology public. We're creating these records for the public benefit. All the work that we do is for, public, is for the public. And we also have a duty to make public archaeology good archaeology, because the two, it all, it all goes hand in hand. And I, I don't, well, it is an issue, but I, it shouldn't be an issue. We, the two things shouldn't be, in, we shouldn't be in different split. Right, so I'll just talk a little bit about, how much do for time? Um. Uh, at least five minutes. Uh, oh, one more. Okay, I'm sorry. still on page one. I'm not sorry. monitoring this oh, talk. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, there's Wales. Viviana showed you a very similar map, but with different colours. Uh, and the, the blue bit is our bit here. Uh, and uh, it's interesting because I did sort of pick up on this slightly earlier. Uh, Anglo, there is, Anglo centricism is, is evident in a lot of the published literature and approaches uh, to community archaeology. And uh, it's important because heritage has become particularly important in Wales since devolution, and in fact in Scotland I think as well in this, for the same reasons, because it's all to do with identity <coughs> and placemaking and, and creating uh, that sort of thing. Um, so Welsh Archaeological Trusts, um, you will hear more about this this evening, and you know there are four Welsh Archaeological Trusts originating 40 years ago, um, and initially at least largely funded by Welsh government or Welsh offices it was then, uh, and still largely uh, delivering a lot of CADU's uh, direct public engagement um, out there through archaeology. Um, and we, have, we do have an important role in relation to a lot of these rural communities, and I'll come on to that in a bit. But I just want to sort of highlight really the issues that we face um, in Paris, or in our, sorry, in our area, uh, is about 8,000 square kilometres. And the population averages 25 people per square kilometre. And I know some of our Scottish colleagues have similar issues, but that's not a massively <coughs> dense uh, population. And I can't remember what the figure for Cardiff is, but it's in my abstract, if you, if you care to look it up. 
So clearly there are a number of uh, challenges. Lots of low populations, very dispersed, in powers particularly there's a lack of large settlements. The largest settlement is Newtown with 10,000 people, where our offices in Welford there are 6,000 people, which is not a massive amount of people. Uh, lots of small villages, they have very strong identities, but lots of dispersed farmsteads and sorts of things. And as I mentioned earlier, um, there is rural poverty, and it's very real, um, and there's a poverty of isolation because of this lack of networks and connections, whether they're internet or real ones, you know, no buses or that sort of stuff. Um, it's very, very difficult. Um, also, in Wales, there's the question, what is heritage? Which is answered slightly differently in Wales from how it is in other parts of the United Kingdom. It's all about the land and memories of natural events and, you know, that deep knowledge of land and landscape, pride in historic features. And archaeologists, we think in terms of, sort of sites and monuments and, and landscapes to some extent, but in a very sort of abstract and, and intellectual sort of way. Um, and also we're dealing with tangible heritage, in a sense. But for a lot of the farming communities in our area, um, heritage is about landscape, memory, people, events, and it's a much more intangible thing. But there's a very powerful sense of place, but it, it comes from intangible heritage, folklore, family history, that sort of thing. And one of the things we do do in the Welsh Archaeological Group Trust is we, uh, our heritage management teams, deal with uh, an agri-environment scheme called Glastir, and we enable farmers to manage the monuments on their land and, and provide uh, schemes by which they can do that. And I think that's a way we already have, a route we already have into a lot of these communities. Um, which I think is, is quite valuable, but we perhaps need to enhance that. Also, and I speak as somebody who was born in Bangor, but is fundamentally an Englishman, there is a language barrier um, between English and English, between the English that we speak as archaeologists and the English that normal people speak, uh, which are very different languages indeed, uh, and between English and Welsh, which is a real issue that we have, um, because the archaeological record is primarily created in English and is not always easily translatable or relates to local terminologies for landscape. <coughs> I'm sort of reminded of these uh, in this of these apocryphal stories of the Irish archaeological boom being populated by Polish archaeologists in all the context sheets are filled in in Polish and the problem that's going to create. I don't think it's true or not, but that's the story we hear <laughs> on the circuit. But it's a bit like that. We're sort of imperialist in linguistic terms, uh, creating a record in English, um, which is not translatable, as I say, or relates to local terminology. Also, Welsh is very much a spoken language, and some ideas in English, or that we might articulate in English, are very difficult to translate into spoken Welsh or written Welsh. And in fact, even if you send a piece of English writing to two different translators, they will have quite a different opinion on how, how it should read in Welsh. So that's <coughs> problematic, too. Um, so I now come on to a slide which is, oh, that's challenging. Yeah, that was challenging. That was challenging. Are we done on that? There we go. Sorry. Okay, just a summary of what I've just said. Uh, uh, right, there's solutions. I don't have any solutions, uh, really. Just, <laughs> just some idea. Because the whole point is this is a discussion, really. And I would, I've only got two minutes. That's fine. Uh, so I want, I want you to suggest things, really, fundamentally. Um, so I don't know what happens. Oh, nothing happens. Right. Uh, I'll put that up because that's prettier than the word solutions. <laughs> public funding um, is a core part of public archaeology in Wales. Uh, we're already very good at tapping into the wider political framework, but I think we need to think more imaginatively about this. Uh, and <clears throat> I think actually our, our um, colleagues in CADU and in Welsh Government are already encouraging us to pursue these sorts of directions, these non-heritage angles, health and well-being and, and all these sorts of agendas, which Although there is some scepticism in the archaeological community about our ability to address those, I think that is something we do need to think about. Because I think there are, and I mentioned Rachel's Homeless Projects earlier, and that has some really good, tangible outcomes. The problem is measuring it. And Viviana showed a slide of numbers earlier on, um, which are, you know, I mean, it's very easy to measure the sort of uh, quantifiable thing, but, the, but it's the quality that's actually really difficult to measure. It's the quality of outputs of individual narratives and stories that's really difficult to measure. So we need to think about that too. Um, so actually, you know, in terms of outreach, it's actually sort of going out, it's actually going out to people and not expecting them to go to you. And Peter's, I don't know if he's still here, um, his answer to uh, 
Gemma, or Natalie, she's probably a man, she's probably a man, she's a question about um, taking the archaeology from somewhere else and bringing it to Merthyr Tidwell. I thought that was, that was quite illuminating, actually. And we, of course, do stalls and presentations at all sorts of events, engage with young farmers' clubs and local shows, our Stepford and all that sort of stuff. And we realise that all groups are interested in heritage, but they just don't realise it. One of the really successful things we did last year was go to the Wales Pool Air Show. And um, that was quite fun, for lots of reasons. But 10,000 people go to the Wales Pool Air Show. And we had a little stand there, and we talked about one of our projects, which Richard actually did on aircraft crashes, which perhaps <coughs> isn't necessarily right up to the position. But people go to an air show are interested in heritage. They have an interest in historic aircraft, and so they have an interest in history and old vehicles and stuff like that. And so you can draw them in that way. And it's trying to find different avenues to approach heritage and not just put archaeology in a box or a bubble, but to have it uh, out there as part of anything else. And uh, also a forthcoming uh, CADU HLF funded <coughs> project on uh, unloved heritage. And our contribution to that is, is going to be um, the impact of the internal combustion engine on, on the landscape of Paris. And so we're going to be going and talking to people in Bergevin and all that sort of stuff. It's, uh, it's, and caravan sites and stuff. So it's uh, finding slightly more imaginative ways to address these things. The other avenue uh, is the question of our relationship with the natural environment professions, uh, and so nature and history conservation, which do go hand in hand uh, quite well. And we've done a number of projects, and the has been involved with these, working with um, students uh, of agriculture, effectively, and land management, um, and looking at the conservation of monuments uh, in this case, this is Beacon Ring, uh, Hillfort, which we actually own, but we sort of use it as a, as a template for the Tesco piece of thing. Uh, a bunch of accountants in this photograph. Um, but anyway, that's by the by. But in terms of managing vegetation and long term management of sites, which again is something that we talk about and address through the Glass Tier um, <coughs> programme, but it creates a space for discussion about heritage <coughs> and the ethos of conservation generally and how we can bring these two often very separate areas of endeavour together. When in fact we find we share quite a lot with our colleagues on the environmental and conservation side. Um, oh, I've got a section called ethics now, so I've put up a photograph of some wind farms because that's germane to consideration of ethics as well. First and foremost, as I said before, we are an educational charity, and as Viviana has already said, and I've already said, and I'll do that again, public archaeology is central to everything uh, that we do, including the commercial archaeology and development. But we do need to do this in an ethical manner, which I am, I am coming to the end. Uh, in an ethical manner, um, which does justice to the archaeology and doesn't patronise people. And, and again, let's go back to what I made at the beginning. That by doing real archaeology properly, we're actually um, pe people, in my experience, who want to, non archaeologists who want to engage with archaeology, want to engage with proper archaeology being done properly and seek the support of archaeologists and want to learn from us. It's quite rare, well you do sometimes get these sort of militant groups who go off and they talk to other archaeologists, but generally speaking people do want to, you do, yeah, it's true, and, but generally speaking people do want to engage with the profession and have their work authorised really, it's all about the authorised heritage discourse, but they do like to have it authorised, um, has anybody mentioned the authorised heritage discourse today? I don't know, what was the first? Um, well, I have. Anyway, they, they, this authorisation and validation uh, by archaeologists is uh, massively important, I think, for non-professionals, and we need to uh, seize on that and, and use that to our advantage. So, uh, I don't actually have any solutions, but fundamentally that's a summary of what I've been saying. Uh, we need to engage with wider agendas, we need to work with non-heritage organisations, we need to rethink what constitutes heritage a bit, whether it's talking to our farmers about their understanding of their sense of place, which is very deeply rooted, or whether it's talking to uh, historic aviation enthusiasts or, um, you know, whatever. Um, the relationship, as I said, between environmental conservation, land management and archaeology is also very important. And we just need to get out there and um, go to people, really, fundamentally. But, as I say, it's important that we don't reinvent the wheel uh, we need to sort of build on existing structures and initiatives, I think, because otherwise we just spend so much energy trying to do new things. But there are those structures, like the Glass Tier Program, so in place, and we need to do that. And so I shall come to an end.